Thanks so much, Bryce. Yep, just give me a second here to share out my screen. All right, can everybody see that? Looks great, sounds good. Okay, perfect. All right, so yeah, uh, thank you, Bryce. Appreciate that. Um, my name is Jason Ravieri, aka Nimble, and we're gonna talk about mind meld today. Uh, really just wanted to give a shout out to all the uh, B-Sides sponsors and uh, the B-Sides organi organizers, you know, just fantastic job switching this over to virtual. You know, I'm gonna miss seeing everybody this year, but uh, great that we can still get together virtually and, and have these good conversations. So it's it's been a great con so far and I've really enjoyed it. Um, so this is me, this is how to get in touch with me. Uh, uh, I've been a consultant for a long time, recently moved over to a technical marketing engineer position within Palo Alto Networks. Uh, I do wanna mention that uh, while I am a, a big fan of Palo Alto Networks and obviously an employee, uh, the views expressed here are my own and not that directly of my employer. And then I'm here just as, a, as an enthusiast, a security practitioner and uh, not directly representing them. So, um, you know, I've been around a while, a uh, member of DC801. I love cryptography and privacy. I'm a bit of an enthusiast there, not an expert, an enthusiast. So, um, so mind meld solves some interesting problems and I wanna talk about what we're trying to do with it. Um, you know, there's a lot of really good resources out there on the internet, uh, whether they're threat intelligence or or lists of data that can be leveraged by uh, security appliances, by endpoint security products, by uh, SIMs, you name it, right? Um, but the problem is, is while we have kind of an established format um, with Sticks Taxi, uh, a lot of these tools don't natively uh, digest that that format. So the problem that MindMeld is trying to solve is essentially to normalize that data into a format that these other tools can, can handle. Uh, you know, there's some really interesting use cases that you can, uh, you can use that for, right? So you can take these threat intelligence feeds, whether they're public open source threat intelligence feeds, like one of my favorites, the SANS DShield Top 20. You can also digest private feeds. There's some, uh, you know, full threat intelligence platforms that you can pull that data in. And what mind will, meld will do, like I said, will kind of normalize that data to be digested by these other systems downstream. Uh, it will also help maybe uh, uh, deduplicate that data as it's being normalized so that if for some reason the platform that you're, you're using to, as an enforcement point, for instance, can, has a hard limit on the number of uh, data points it can pull in, mind meld can help reduce that uh, those number of data points as they're being pulled in. Uh, so, so very, very helpful, uh, especially if you, you know, the, the platform has any kind of limitations around that. Um, there's also some interesting use cases about pulling in uh, feeds for positive enforcement, not just for uh, you know, understanding uh, threats or, or that sort of thing, but uh, in a dynamic uh, cloud environment, for instance, your, your, your resources are going to be uh, spun up and tore down on a regular basis. And those, uh, say, IP addresses or FQDNs will constantly be changing. And it's a very dynamic list, right? And so uh, understanding uh, network traffic flows to, uh, say, Microsoft uh, O365, uh, Microsoft o O365, sorry, um, you know, can be a very uh, cumbersome task without being able to uh, digest Microsoft's published list of resources that are out there. And so uh, a tool like MindMeld helps, helps really uh, pull that into uh, your tool set and uh, uh, understand where that traffic is going. So you're interested, right? Uh, I hope, uh, you know, how can you do more? How can you digest this tool? So uh, the current two best options for installation are spinning up the Docker image or compiling directly from source using Ansible. Uh, when MindMeld was first released, 
uh, you know, was released as a, a VM on an OVA, um, that sort of thing. You know, really, it seems like the Docker way is 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 probably the best, easiest way right now. Uh, so I've got here the full URLs, but I created some some Bitly shortened URLs for everybody uh, to use if you're interested in the Docker image. It's there. If you want to compile direct from source on Ansible, it's there. Uh, and I'll I'll post the slides to Slack after this, minus the copyrighted materials. So, okay, so I'm going to show you today uh, pulling and leveraging MindMeld uh, from the Docker image. Uh, but I want to show you a couple of things that I did ahead of time before we dive directly into the demo. So uh, I my Linux distro of choice is Ubuntu. So I spun up a new Ubuntu server. And basically, the first thing you want to do is just make sure that there's no uh, legacy or, or pre-installed Docker uh, uh, packages. You then pull down some prerequisites for Docker. And then also the Docker uh, GPG key. And then update your uh, repository with the, the official Docker repository for Ubuntu. And then install Docker. And if you think I went through that a little too, oh, wait, one, one other thing. I don't like running Docker images as root. So I then add my user to the Docker group, uh, just kind of uh, security best practice, I guess. Um, and if you think I went through that a little too quick, this is all very well documented on the Docker website. And you know I don't want to turn this into an exercise on how to run Docker. Uh, I want to focus on my mouth. So uh, there's a link to doing that. All right, so let's switch out of the slides and get right to business here. <clears throat> Everybody still see the screen okay? Yeah, yeah. We can still see the screen. Okay, perfect. Okay, thank you very much. So um, in the interest of time, I am going to copy and paste these commands. But again, if you go to that that Docker link. Um, this is all very well documented there. So I'm going to pull the Docker image from the, the official uh, Docker repository. And I'm going to, going to create a volume for the MindMeld logs. And for uh, my mind meld uh, uh, local configuration. And then we're going to spin up the Docker image. And again, that's kind of a long command. I just copied and pasted and, and cheated. Um, but again, I didn't want to be sitting here fumbling around on the keyboard while everybody's watching. So. so, and then if you look at the logs, you can see. Um, what we're looking for here is, is the successful start of the MindMeld uh, web service. And so then we should be able to pivot over to the MindMeld instance. And... All right. <clears throat> and the default credentials here are admin. Mind meld. <clears throat> we see here we've already uh, on the dashboard view uh, the Docker image comes pre compiled and set up with uh, four miners, a processor, and three outputs. Uh, I'll go into those in a minute. But, uh, you know, again, this is a security conference. We're all security people. So, first thing we're going to do is go in and change that admin password. So, I'm going to uh, click admin. And then I'm going to click password there. And I'll give it a stronger password. All right. <clears throat> the other thing that I want to do is maybe I don't want to use the default admin username. Maybe I want to uh, create an additional user. Uh, that's done with this plus right here. Add me as a user, this guy. Super secret password. All right. 
and now I've got a non-admin user, and then I can go in and delete that admin uh, uh, user if I wanted to. So let's uh, look across the top here at the, the different tabs. Um, first one I want to show you is the system tab. This is kind of your high-level view of what um, MindMeld is up to. You know, are the services running? Uh, you know, how much CPU utilization is happening here, memory utilization, that sort of thing. I already touched on the admin tab. Uh, we looked at the dashboard, but um, what I really want to show you here is the nodes, right? So this is this is the meat of what MindMeld is doing. Uh, we've got these three different node types within MindMeld. You have your miners, which are essentially the sources for data out on the internet, uh, or you know maybe on private systems, what have you. Then you have an aggregator that those miners are connected to. That um, aggregator or processor takes that data and as I mentioned, uh, normalizes it and deduplicates it and then feeds it to an output. An easier way to sometimes look at this is if we click on the miner, you can uh, and then click on the connection graph. We can see here on the on the left side, you know, all these miners reaching out, going into an aggregator, and then feeding into these output feeds out on the right. So <clears throat> pretty straightforward uh, from from a uh, uh, a graphical representation standpoint. The other thing that you can do is uh, look at the statistics of these miners. Uh, how much data is it pulling in, right? Um, you know, the D shield block list is always going to be 20. Uh, the top 20 class C's that you should just uh, generally block on your network or watch uh, for uh, traffic that's egressing your network that, you know, or communications happening to these. So, so one of the key things here is, you know, being able to understand the relationship that your, your, your endpoints or your network traffic is having to these known bad uh, uh, networks, right? Or these known, known bad uh, data points. <clears throat> so let's see. Let's say, um, you know, you want to add some more data uh, to come in here, right? So um, first thing I, li I like to point out is the pre-built whitelist. Uh, for IPv4, right? So, so here we've got um, a static list that we can add. So um, say um, you leverage Google DNS heavily and you never want Google DNS to be included on one of those, uh, one of those output feeds that you're leveraging in your, your security appliance. We can come in here and add that to the whitelist. And then if we look at that, that relationship, we can see now that the whitelist has one indicator IP. So if uh, Quad 8's uh, Google DNS were ever to show up on, say, the, the Spam House uh, drop or eDrop list or DShield or any of those, um, it would always be whitelisted because it's part of this, this miner that will be pulled into the aggregator and will override the output. <clears throat> but let's say uh, you want to add another uh, miner, right? You've got your favorite source of, of data that uh, you know is really, really uh, high fidelity that you want to pull in and leverage within the network. Um, so how you do that is you click on configuration here. And then down here, this little hamburger looking icon is where you can look at the prototypes. So these prototypes are uh, either miners or ag aggregators or output prototypes. Uh, one of my favorites is the uh, ET Open block list. So Emerging Threats, really good group, uh, does some good work. So if we search for ET Open, we see that, you know, that that uh, list is maintained here as a pre-built uh, uh, prototype. We click on that, and then we click clone a new node from this prototype. And normalize name all right so now we have it listed here but notice it's not connected to the processor this is a slightly counterintuitive piece to mind melt that 
uh, sometimes will trip folks up when I've, when I've helped people put this in in their networks. You have to click over here on inputs. If you remember the relationship diagram that I showed you earlier, uh, you know, your miners were on the left, they feed into processors or the processor sets input from those miners and then the processor then pushes to the output or the output, you know, has a, um, pulls from the processor. So we have to add that new node or miner, excuse me, to the, the processor. And we do that by clicking over here on the right hand side. And when we click in here, we'll see, yes, look, ET open is now in that. We click OK. We see it here, but you're not done. You have to commit those changes. So uh, you commit that configuration and it restarts the, the mind meld engine. Um, it gives you lots of good statistical graphic representation of what it's doing in the top right there. <clears throat> Give it a second to run. All right. So now we're running. So now if we click on the nodes and look at the ET open block list, we can see that there are 1,834 indicators and it is directly feeding into that aggregator. So what's this data look like if we actually, you know, were to, to try and pull it into one of these systems and leverage it within a, a, a system? Um, how you can view that is looking, if you click on the output node, uh, you can see here the feed base URL. If I open that up, there's your data, right? So, so this is uh, IP range format uh, to, to view uh, or you know, to be ingested into one of your, your control systems, right? Uh, again, whether it's a SIM or uh, a network appliance or, or an endpoint management system. Um, let's say the system that you're leveraging uh, does not understand this format, right? This, this IP range format. Uh, you can uh, change your outputs, right? Uh, so we do one. Okay, so um, if we just append TR equals or question mark TR equals one to the output. Uh, uh, feed URL, we see that now it gives it to us uh, in CIDR format, uh, which is another very common format that that a, a security appliance or, or SIM might be able to ingest. <clears throat> so let's uh, talk about maybe some, some uh, more advanced use cases, right? Let's say you've got a favorite uh, threat feed that, is, you know, again, you, you feel is, is really high fidelity. But when you go into the prototypes, it's not listed there. So uh, some, uh, a lot of folks out there like the Talos group, right? They do good work um, and they publish a really nice uh, IP list, right? Uh, their IP blacklist. But if we search for prototypes, the Talos group is not there. So let's go look at their, their IP blacklist really quick. And it's just an output of IP addresses, right? So individual IP addresses, um, pretty common format. Uh, so I know that other prototypes leverage that same thing, um, specifically the ET open blacklist, right? So this is, uh, again, my, my friends at, uh, at Emerging Threats. And instead of cloning this one, we're gonna create a new prototype from this, this miner. We can come in and we can modify this. We can say this is the uh, Telos blacklist, right? And notice down here, we've got a, a really simple way of building out a miner. Uh, you know, it basically uh, asks for your competence level in this source, uh, you know, and then give it a name and then a URL where we're pulling that information from. So let's put in that Talos IP blacklist. Let's change this to blacklist.
Okay, so I've, I've uh, modified it so that it's consistent uh, for Talos. And now when I search for Talos, I have a MindMelt local Talos blacklist. Uh, same, same workflow, I can clone it, give it a common name. And then that, that tricky thing to remember is adding it to this IP aggregator, right? Now, let's leave that Talos. We commit that, let it run through its course, and I'll show you that uh, it's pulling in that data. Uh, there's obviously a lot more different types of data sources out there uh, beyond IPv4 addresses, right? And, you know, there's, there's a lot of uh, debate on how valuable this information can be. But for me, my thought is just reduce your attack surface as much as possible, right? Take out these known bads and, uh, you know, if you can block them on a network level, great. You know, if you, if, if the security appliance you're, you're leveraging allows you to, to block them, it just reduces that, that attack surface. You know, they're not these hot IOCs or whatever that some of these, these different groups will, will claim that they've got, you know, the best, the best lists, right? No. But, um, I, again, you know, it can be debated as much as we want, but it's, it's, uh, it's really just about reducing that attack surface, right? Um, and just take the known bads out so that we can really focus on on what matters and and looking at the the, the more advanced type threat data. But we can see now that uh, uh, Talos blacklist has pulled in 1,266 uh, indicators, and our outbound feeds now are are incrementing up. Uh, one one nice view on the dashboard that I, I kind of uh, didn't touch on earlier is if you look here. Um, you can change the time frame. I just clicked that gear on the right. You can change the, the time range. Uh, so as your, your mind meld instance is running for, for days and weeks, you'll have nice statistical graphs here that will show you as indicators have been pulled in from miners and what your total number of indicators are from your outputs. So you can see as I added ET threat feeds and, and the Talos threat feeds, We've had a significant increase in the in the number of of indicators across uh, uh, all the nodes. So uh, I've got a little bit of time. I can show you a couple more uh, advanced use cases here. Uh, and this is the MindMeld instance that I run uh, for my house. Oh yes, I entered my password. Sorry. There we go. <clears throat> and one thing that's interesting is um, if you notice, I've got some other um, some other aggregators here, right? Um, not just IP aggregators, aggregators, but domain and URL aggregators as well that are feeding out to different types of lists. Uh, <clears throat> so again, you know, uh, uh, threat indicators are not always going to be IPs, right? They're, uh, there are uh, free lists out there that will give you other interesting things like a uh, malware domain list, things like that, right? And if we look at what those outputs, and we can see here, these are, um, you know, full URIs, right? Uh, uh, and if we look at, say, this one, oops, excuse me. Sorry. So uh, instead of full URIs, you know, here I've got uh, just malicious domains, no malicious domains. Um, so you can see how maybe that, that might be interesting on integrating it to, uh, say, a uh, threat hunting feed within a SIM or, uh, you know, some kind of uh, EDR tool set, something like that. No questions, so I'll just do one more thing really quick. 
and show you guys how, um, again, how you would pull this into uh, my favorite security appointments. Anybody who knows me knows that I've been a, a, a fan of this for a very long time. So. All right, so um, external dynamic lists are generally how uh, uh, the Palo Alto Network security platform digests mind meld data. And so we can see here, you know, I've got these uh, dynamic IP lists. These are pointing directly to those, those uh, sources on my mind meld instance. But I've also got these domains and URLs that I just showed you guys there. So these uh, dynamic IP lists are essentially IP groups that can be leveraged in security policy uh, for positive or negative enforcement. Uh, you know, you can block things to known bad, uh, you can block um, bogans, that sort of thing. How you leverage your, your domain lists um, are in the, the spyware uh, uh, security profiles. You can see here the, the mind meld domain list is available there and and you can take a uh, security action on that and the url filtering is also in the the url filtering profiles so with that i am about out of time um but uh i think we've got a couple minutes for q a if if anybody has any questions uh again mind meld is a is a is a open source project uh it was started by palo alto networks but it is community maintained so uh, you know, feel free to to be involved as much uh, as as appropriate, and I uh, appreciate the time. So.